Good evening and welcome to our webinar. I'm Chris McLaughlin, Secretary, Ireland Network. I wish to mention the following few items before the presentation begins. If you have any questions, you can post them in the Q&A box below and we'll pass them to Kieran and Jan at the end of their presentation. If you wish to receive a CPD certificate for the webinar, you can click on the link in the chat box below and download it from there. And finally, this webinar is being recorded for future uploading to our YouTube page. I now wish to pass to the chairperson of the Ireland Network, Aidan Langley. Aidan. Thank you, Chris. Um, as the current chair of the, uh, the IET Ireland Network, I'd like to welcome all uh, members of the IET to this joint IET France and IET Ireland event uh, on the Celtic Interconnector. Uh, I'd also like to welcome all the members of Engineers Ireland to the call um, as co-sponsors of the IET Ireland programme this year. Uh, Kieran has been a chartered engineer since 2011, having graduated from UCC in electrical and electronic engineering in 2005. He's currently the technical lead for Airgrid on the Celtic interconnector between France and Ireland. Jan is his opposite number, working for RTE, the, uh, the National Transmission System Operator in France, since 2003, and on a number of similar projects uh, between France and UK and France and Spain, uh, and um, uh, there's a lot of experience in the area. Having welcomed everybody, I'd li like to pass it on to Kieran, uh, and uh, we've got a great attendance I can see this evening, so uh, I'll pass on to you, Kieran. It's actually Timothy we're passing on to. Okay. Um, thank you, Aidan. Um, Tim Lorkin. Uh, I'm the chair, current chair of the IET in France. Um, I'd like to thank Chris and all the speakers tonight for the hard work in getting this um, 400 person event potentially uh, up and running. In France, we're not quite so numerous as in Ireland. Um, the IET is not as well known um, over here. We're hoping to increase that, uh, change that in the near future. Um, with events such as this, that'll be certainly happening. Um, I'd like to thank everyone and please do enjoy yourself tonight. And I would like to pass over to Kieran um, to start the talk. Great. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, and, and thank you, Aidan and Chris as well. So I'll just open up uh, the presentation and share my screen here. Okay, um, I'm assuming that that's all working. Otherwise, Chris would, would be letting me know by now. So look, it, it, it's great uh, to have the opportunity this evening to discuss the Celtic Interconnector Project. Uh, um, it's a shame, obviously, that we can't hold these, these presentations uh, in person at the moment and, and the COVID restrictions um, restrict us, I, I guess, or allow us to use the webinar function, but we're, we're all becoming a bit more adept uh, using Zoom for, for webinars, so it's, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good means to, to get the message across. Um, so again, yes, the, the presentation this evening is about the, the Celtic Interconnector. Um, tonight, um, I'm going to be joined by my counterpart in RTE in France, uh, Jan Dolan uh, in giving an overview of the project. What we'd like to discuss uh, is the project itself, what it entails, why it's being developed along with the objectives and benefits um, the project is gonna bring. We'll bring a few slides together around the technology that's intended to be used for the interconnector, both for the converter stations um, on the Irish and the French side, and also for the the land cable, uh, the land DC cable, and also the submarine cables that will link the two converter stations together. We'll also give an overview of the marine surveys um, that have been undertaken and enabled us and allowed us to choose the planned route for the cable between Ireland and France. And we'll give an overview of, of the roadmap or the process that, that we've been following as two TSOs in delivering this infrastructure or, or developing this project. And then just to close out, I'll, I'll give a summary of the, the present status of the project and some of the recent uh, and upcoming milestones. So just to be, 
just to begin then, um, what is the Celtic Interconnector Project? Um, so it, it's a planned HVDC interconnector that will link the Irish electricity system to the French electricity system and will also enable a, a connection then from Ireland to the mainland Europe and, and the EU energy network. So the interconnector is, is planned to run from the east coast of Cork uh, to Brittany on the northwest coast of France. We give a bit more detail later on on the landfall points as well as the onshore cable routes. Um, the project, it's a joint development between Airgrid, who are the transmission system operator here in Ireland, and RTE, um, in our counterparts in, in France, uh, the transmission system operator over there. And, and the project uh, will be the first electrical connection between the two countries and the first from Ireland to mainland Europe. The project is noted in the NSOE, uh, 10 year network development plans, which assess electricity transmission network projects on an EU wide basis. So the Celtic interconnector has been designated as a project of common interest um, by the EU since 2013, which means it's been identified as a key project required to integrate European electricity markets. The project has also been designated as an electrical highway um, under the e-highway 2050 project, which identif identifies the project as part of the developments on the European grid needed to meet the EU's 2050 low carbon economy goals. So the project is one of, one of the very few that has achieved this double standard or, or this double labeling. Moving on then, uh, a, just a brief slide from me initially on, on who Airgrid are, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, to Jan to give a brief overview of, of the RT aspect. So here in Ireland, Airgrid are the transmission system operator who are responsible for the, the transmission grid here um, on an all island basis. So we're, we're responsible for ensuring a safe, secure, reliable supply of electricity. Um, and, and we develop, manage and operate the electricity grid to meet, to balance generation against demand in real time and, and also to plan the network for present requirements and future requirements. So as part of that, we're mandated to explore and develop opportunities to interconnect the Irish system with other systems. And it was under this mandate that we have previously developed an interconnection known as the East-West Interconnector that's running between um, Portan or Woodland in Meath to Shotton in North Wales. And, and that interconnector has been in operation since 2012. So what, I, what I'll do here is I'll, I'll go on mute and I'll pass over to Jan um, to uh, give an introduction or overview of RTE. Yeah. Hi, ho. Um, RTE, Réseau de Transport d'Electricité in French, is the transmission operator in France. Uh, by its location in the center of Europe, it is one of the most important uh, in Europe, uh, with more than 100 kilometers of uh, links, 90% uh, it's uh, over headline, and 2,700 uh, substation. We operate the network uh, between uh, 63,000 volt and 400,000 volt. We already have a lot of uh, interconnection with uh, different countries like Belgium, Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, UK, and, uh, and Switzerland. And uh, for the moment, only two are on uh, HVDC, one with Spain and the other uh, with uh, UK. I'll let you uh, the next slide, uh, Karen. Thanks, Jan. Okay. So just to give an overview and, um, and a bit more detail on, on what is involved in the interconnector, um, uh, we, we've spoken about the two project promoters here who are Airgrid and RTE. So the entire interconnector will be approximately 500, 575 kilometers in length and, and 500 kilometers of that is gonna be in the marine environment. Um, the power transfer capacity of the interconnector is gonna be 700 megawatts. In terms of the further detail around this, the, um, the power rating of 700 megawatts was based on a set of studies and analysis of the network strengths of the, the two points on the respective Irish and French networks. And 700 megawatts is, is an important figure um, 
in the Irish context. The, the current largest single infeed or, or outflow from the Irish network at the moment is, is that of the east-west interconnector, which is 500 megawatts. So in determining the suitable transfer capacity uh, of 700 megawatts, we carried out a number of, of studies uh, on a range of factors, including operational requirements and characteristics of, of the existing Irish system. So in, in determining what the most suitable capacity level would be uh, and, and the avoidance of the need to have large grid reinforcements or, or significant operational changes, um, 700 megawatts was, was the, the capacity level uh, that was deemed to be the optimum. The AC voltage is then on, on both sides of the link. So the connection on the French side uh, is into an existing Lamartier 400 kV substation. And on the Irish side, we will be installing a 400 kV connection from the converter station to the existing grid at Nakraha, which is a 220 kV uh, existing substation. The DC voltage um, for the link is going to be 320 kV uh, and, and 320 kV is, I suppose you could almost term it a, an industry standard voltage level for uh, a HVDC interconnector with a power transfer capacity of, of about 700 megawatts. The technology that we're intending to, to use for the interconnector is what's known as voltage source converter technology and, and I have a few slides again later on in the presentation that outline some of the benefits and advantages of, of using VSC technology. Um, some of the main reasons would be its, its uh, ability um, to operate at, at low short circuit ratios for the Irish and French transmission connection points. Um, VSC schemes have less reliance on, on short circuit ratios and can operate in, in completely passive networks, um, networks with no generation and with, with zero or low fault level. And, and that comes with a lot of serious advantages really, uh, especially for, for Ireland. Um, so it gives, it gives required characteristics um, such as voltage support uh, that, that will support the, the Cork region and the Brittany region in France. It will provide black star capability and also frequency response uh, for the system. Um, following a review of, of all the benefits of VSC technology, it was decided that the optimum configuration to deploy the VSC technology in would be in a symmetrical monopole configuration. And very simply, what symmetrical monopole means is uh, a converter station either side of the, the link uh, connected by two DC power cables at opposite polarities to each other. Um, the final aspect of the, the interconnector is the installation of a fiber optic cable, which will be laid in a bundle uh, with the two DC power cables and, and will provide a fiber connection between the converter station in Brittany to the converter station in, in Cork. So the next question, um, why, why are we doing this project at all uh, and, and why have we been pursuing it and, and developing it over the course of the past number of years? Um, and, and very simply, and, and I touched on it uh, earlier on a little bit as well, is that uh, Airgrid as, as transmission system operator here in Ireland uh, are mandated to, to look for opportunities for interconnection. Um, under condition nine of our, our license and regulation uh, eight of SI 445, we have a statutory, statutory obligation to develop opportunities for, for interconnection. Uh, in 2009, Airgrid published a, an interconnector economic feasibility report. Um, and within this report, the potential for interconnection for France was included. And, and it has been included in the transmission system development plan since 2012. And it was under this, a very similar mandate uh, that we developed the, the east-west interconnector that I, I previously mentioned as well. The, so the, the project is um, of national strategic importance to both Ireland and France. It, it's going to allow Ireland directly contribute to and be part of the, the EU energy union. And it will also reduce our electrical isolation. So at, at the moment, Ireland has low levels of interconnection. Uh, the interconnection we have is made up of, of uh, 0.95 gigawatts or 950 megawatts, uh, which consists of 
450 megawatts via the Moyle interconnector between Northern Ireland and uh, Great Britain, and also the 500 megawatt interconnector EWIC between um, Portan and Meath and Shotton in, in Great Britain also. So Ireland is currently below the EU electricity interconnection targets of 10% by 2020 and 15% by 2030. And with the UK leaving the energy union, Ireland is going to have 0% interconnection level with European countries. So in that regard, Ireland is, is triggering all three of the European Commission's thresholds, which are designed to identify the need for development of interconnection. And those are Ireland's average yearly price difference is greater than two euro per megawatt hour uh, between countries or regions. Ireland's interconnection capacity is below 30% of our peak load and Ireland's interconnection capacity is below 30% of installed renewable generation. On the French aspect, the, the development of the interconnector is consistent with the, the ambitions of the French government uh, as set out in the 2018 multi-annual energy plan. Uh, and this plan uh, identifies requirements to prepare a more flexible and carbon free energy system. It identified the need for the development of renewable energy sources and it aligns with the need to reinforce interconnections between France and its neighbours. So that, that was the, I guess, the, the, the need for the project and why it's being developed. We'll take a quick look now at the, the objectives and, and the benefits um, of the, the Celtic Interconnector. So there, there are three main objectives of the Interconnector and those are to improve market integration, to enhance security of supply for both Ireland and France, and also then to increase the use of renewable energy sources uh, for electricity or RESI as, as it's commonly known. So just to start with, the market integration uh, benefit. So the, the Celtic Interconnector will, will directly connect the single electricity market here in Ireland to the French electricity market and consequently the EU internal energy market. So by doing so, it will facilitate increased electricity trading and, and that will result in downward pressure on the cost of electricity to consumers. So price differentials between the markets are significant. Um, and with Ireland's wholesale electricity prices being on average 13 euro per megawatt hour or 26% higher than in France. Um, and that's based on 2018 figures, I should say, and 19% higher than the EU average. Um, so the single electricity market in Ireland uh, has recently completed a, a major transformation to comply with the European target model for electricity. And, and what the interconnector will do is that it will ensure Irish consumers benefit from this transformation and the market, market coupling objectives of the EU. It will increase competition in the energy capacity and ancillary service markets, which will again further uh, improve market outcomes and, and deliver value for the customer. In terms of enhancing security of supply, um, the project will, will enable this by, by very simply providing providing an additional supply of power uh, and increased diversification of energy sources for Ireland and France. So it will enable the, the pooling of the, the risk of load shedding between the countries. And analysis has shown that there's a low level of correlation between France and Ireland's residual demand profile, which is demand less the variable renewable generation. Um, and, and notably, it's far lower than the correlations with Great Britain. So this indicates that there's a significant potential for mutual support uh, between France and Ireland. And as mentioned earlier, the, the Celtic Interconnector will also provide Black Star capability and flexibility services for frequency and voltage support uh, for Ireland and France. Um, the, the Interconnector will, will also contribute to the security of supply of France during peak hours, but also in any other contingency situations where, where adequacy on the French side is, is at risk. Uh, France has planned significant changes in its generation mix in order to further reduce the carbon uh, intensity of, of electricity generation. And this includes the phasing out of coal, along with the increased development of solar and wind generation. But 
I suppose developing a, a less carbon intensive generation mix that can't be optimized if it's at the expense of, of security of supply. The intermittent nature of renewable energy sources being developed uh, both in Ireland and in France and throughout the EU reinforces the need for interconnection between France and its neighbors and, and also the development of, of new flexible systems. And, and it's here that the Celtic interconnector is part of, of the overall strategy in terms of security of supply. It, it's, it's a benefit, but it's not the only solution. The third benefit of the project then is the increased uh, use of, of RESI or renewable energy sources uh, for electricity. So Ireland uh, has, has one of the largest renewable capacities available in Europe, um, particularly with respect to, to onshore wind and, and the offshore wind side of things is, is really taking off now in Ireland also. In the absence of the Celtic interconnector, we here in Ireland would face difficulties facilitating the, the full utilization of, of this renewable energy resource. The, the interconnector will allow for efficient utilization of the wind energy potential um, and it, it will do that by allowing us to reduce curtailment and, and also the need to subsidize or to support resi development um, and it will allow us to export renewable energy from Ireland to the larger market in, in France and Europe. So allowing more renewable energy onto our system to meet our demand and, and allowing the excess uh, to be transferred to, to the continent. Uh, the, the interconnector itself is going to be a key enabler of, of some of the recent Irish uh, government policy to develop RESI. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on, on the webinar this evening will be familiar with the, the energy and climate plan and, and the target of having 70% RESI by 2030. Um, one of the other good or key benefits of, of the interconnector um, was, was identified in the analysis that we did in developing the project and that it would lead to a reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, according to a cost benefit analysis uh, carried out using the, the TYNDP um, frameworks, it's estimated that the delivery, the, sorry, the delivery of the project will result in an additional renewable energy integration of somewhere between 850 and 915 gigawatt hours per year. And, and this would equate to an estimated reduction of 535 million tons of, of CO2 per year. So by allowing for sustainable development of wind energy and by being part of the French objectives for the development of interconnections to facilitate the decarbonization of their energy mix, the project is directly contributing to the EU objectives of the energy transition. Just a, a very quick slide then to illustrate how it is that we've been developing the project to date between Airgrid and, and RT in France. Um, there's been a couple of clear distinct stages with, with stage gate elements associated at the end of them to ensure project viability and um, governance to move to the next phase, etc. So this really began with the, the pre-feasibility phase in 2011, um, where I suppose the, the initial benefits uh, and exploration of, of an interconnector were, were being explored and aspects around what the potential benefits could be, what technology options were available to us and, and what the likely costs associated with it would be were, were explored. Following the completion of that phase, we moved into the, the feasibility phase in 2014. And it was here that we moved into the marine surveys and undertook marine surveys and looked at in more detail at, at how the, the project could be implemented physically in the marine environment and also technically from a, a, an existing network connection perspective. A lot of economic and financial ana analysis was done during this phase also to ensure the, the continuing viability of the project. 2016 to 2019 then looked at what was known as the IDPC phase or the initial design and pre-consultation and here we, we really began the consultation on where the physical infrastructure could sit, both in Ireland and in France. We looked at potential landfall points and potential locations for converter stations. We uh, further explored the technology options that were open to us. Uh, and some key milestones within this phase was the submission of a, an investment request um, 
to the, the national regulatory authorities uh, here in Ireland and in France um, to, to seek uh, assurance that we, we could pursue and, and uh, develop this project. And we also applied for a grant application to the EU to support the project in, in 2019 also. So where we find ourselves at at the moment is uh, previously known as consents contracting and construction. It's probably more better known within the project now as DDC or detailed design and construction. And um, we're, we're looking to uh, submit our consents application here in Ireland. I, I believe Jan, it's, it's already done in France. We're looking to launch our EPC procurement, which is a, a very, um, I suppose, present milestone, and I'll touch on that later on as well. Uh, and following the, the procurement uh, aspect, we're going to move into the manufacturing, construction and energization uh, for the realization of the interconnected by 2026. I, I touched on the, the grant funding aspect, so just one very quick slide on this. Um, just a, a couple of words to, to say that we applied for the, the funding to the Connecting Europe facility. Um, so it, it's an EU uh, funding instrument for targeted infrastructure investment. Um, the, the budget is, is effectively managed by a, an, an organization known as INEA, which is the Innovation and Networks Executive Agency. And Ergert and Orti submitted a, a grant application to INEA in, in June 2019, um, which had the support of both the Irish and the French governments. And um, you'll see from the, the, the images there, we've got um, the Taoiseach at the time, Leo Varadkar with Emmanuel Macron, um, signing a, a memorandum of understanding on it. And the top image is the respective uh, CEOs or chief executives of Ergert and, and Orti flanked by Irish and, and French ministers. Um, I mentioned that the national regulatory authorities um, uh, supported the application and they have um, given us guidance on, on how the grant funding is to be split in, in terms of the progression of the project. Okay, so that's, that's uh, I suppose, a, an overview and an introduction of, of, of what the project is. I, I have a couple of slides just on some of the technology um, to, to, discuss, um, to discuss what it is that we're, do, we're doing here. So what is HVDC? Uh, and very simply, it's point to more, point to point transmission of power. Um, and we do that by converting the electricity that, that is used on the Irish uh, transmission grid and the French transmission grid, which is AC, uh, alternating current uh, electricity. We convert it to DC at what's known as a rectifier converter station. Um, and then the power is, is transmitted uh, via the, the cables, the submarine or land cables to, the, to another converter station at the receiving end, which would be termed an inverter, where it's converted back into AC, electrons, AC uh, electricity for connection back into the transmission grid at the other end of the link. Um, it's bi-directional, power can flow uh, um, from Ireland to France and from France to Ireland uh, as required by the market conditions. It isn't a, a case that power can only flow from Ireland to France or from France to Ireland. It, it is reversible and, and the schedule of power will be set by the market conditions. Um, in terms of the technology that was available to us that we we, we could have implemented for the project. I mentioned before we were we were looking at VSC. Um, the, the other alternative technology is, is LCC, which is known as line commutated converters. And, and this this technology would have would be termed uh, conventional HVDC or or classic HVDC. Um, and, and it differs from VSC in that it, it uses thyristors uh, as opposed to IGBTs and and Thyristors um, uh, don't have the same functionality or abilities as, as the semiconductor devices as, as IGBTs, and I'll come on to that in, in a little bit. I suppose some of the main reasons that we, we didn't go down the route of, of LCC, uh, there's a couple of points really relating to it. Um, LCC converter stations would have a higher reactive power demand. Uh, the, the converter stations would draw reactive power from the AC network, 
uh, and that would require strong AC systems with high short circuit ratios. Um, and because of this, LC schemes, LCC schemes wouldn't be able to deliver what's known as the Black Star capability, which is a huge benefit of, of a VSC scheme. LCC schemes would also produce harmonic currents that would require a high level of, of filtering to meet power quality requirements uh, for onward connection of the power to the transmission networks. So those types of filters, while achievable and, and realizable, they, they do add expense and, and take up a, a lot of physical space within the converter stations. Um, power reversal in, in an LCC scheme is not as uh, straightforward or instantaneous as it is in a, in a VSC scheme. Um, it involves a reversal of the polarity of, of the link. Um, it, it's a lot more instantaneous on a VSC scheme. And also um, LCC schemes, uh, because of this voltage polarity uh, requirement or change in voltage polarity to change the power flow direction, it limits the type of cable technology that we can use. Uh, LCC schemes would, would need what's known as mass impregnated cables, whereas uh, VSC can use both uh, mass impregnated or extruded or XLPE cables. So there's a, a lot of, I suppose, benefits or uh, I won't call them disadvantages of LCC because LCC you know, has, has a lot of applications where it is more suitable than LCC, but, but in or sorry, than v VSC, but in our instance, uh, VSC is certainly the right choice for us. In terms of the voltage source technology then, um, the fundamental difference between the two, uh, and, and I've touched on it a little bit there, is uh, VSC uses IGBTs, um, with IGBTs have the ability to to be controlled, to be able to switch on, to be switched on and switched off using a, an external control system, whereas pyristors um, can only switch on the point of, of um, the point on the AC waveform at which conduction happens. So with a VSC scheme, you're not relying on the network voltage for commutations. The, the IGBTs are switched uh, under direction under the direction of a, a control system which enables the, the creation of the AC and DC waveforms um, in a much more efficient and, and smoother manner. Um, to go into a bit more detail around the, the advantages of, of VSC, um, I suppose one of the main ones is the controllability of the reactive power. It, it's independent of the active power. So VSC schemes can either provide or consume reactive power and that's controlled by, by an operator, and that is of benefit in terms of managing the AC system. VSC schemes can supply power to a passive network or a network with a low short circuit ratio, and, and this was a, a big drawback of the LCC. Um, so VSC uh, is suitable for connecting areas with little or no synchronous generation, um, and low short circuit ratios also, um, and, and enables VSC schemes to be to be implemented for black start capabilities. So black start, you know, if in a scenario where the Irish system, for example, were to, to go down, we, we could bring it back up again um, from the French system through the interconnector. And, and all we need on the Irish side is an auxiliary power source for the controls and cooling of the converter station, uh, which would be a diesel generator. Um, and like I say, just, just to have the, the French converter station to provide the power to us. In the symmetrical monopole scheme, the converter transformers are also very similar to uh, normal AC transformers. So they're, they're less expensive, easier to repair, uh, and, and somewhat more reliable than, than LCC transformers, which are exposed to significant DC stresses. Um, VSC schemes don't need uh, a large amount of reactive compensation and AC filtering, uh, and that's probably truer of the, the latest generation uh, and advancements in the technology. The, the, multi, the modular multi-level converters are, are producing, uh, I won't say perfect sinusoidal waves, but, but um, close to, which reduces the need for, for filtering. Um, VSC schemes have, and as a result, they have a smaller footprint when, when you strip out the need for those, those uh, filtering. And yeah, just as I mentioned, VSC doesn't need to change the polarity uh, on the link to change, to change the direction of, of power flow. 
um, and therefore we can use the, the extruded XLPE cables as opposed to the, to the mass impregnated cables. Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I should have put that slide up, but, but I've, talked, I've talked through, I think, all of those benefits there, yeah. Just an indication then of, of what a converter station, a VSC converter station would look like. Um, we have a couple of images here. The, the main one in, this, in the middle is, is the EWIC uh, converter station layout. Um, EWIC has a different voltage level for the, the DC than, than Celtic will have. Um, it's a 200 kV. So very simply, we have the DC cables coming into the, to the DC hall where we have some reactors and, and cable sealing terminations. The valve hall, which is the, the high building here, is where the conversion process takes place. Um, we have some more reactors, filters, and these are the, the interface transformers then before we have the, the AC output. There's a couple of, of alternate images here of, of the outside. Um, I'm not sure what converter station that is, Jan, I'm imagining it's, it's IFA 2, and then the, the interior of a, a converter station as well. In terms of the, the cable technology, um, it is the intention of, for the Celtic project to use XLPE cables. We, we did undertake a multi-criteria analysis in terms of what would be the most appropriate cable uh, for the voltage type that we're going for here at 320 kV. Uh, and the output of that analysis was um, XLP cable, which is effectively proven across a broad range of suppliers for, for the voltage range in which we're, we're looking for. As an example, I, I've just put an image here of the, the cables that are used on EWIC. Um, this slightly larger one on the, the left-hand side is the AC cable that links the, the converter station to the existing Woodland 400 kV substation. Um, the one in the middle is the DC land cable, which is uh, made of aluminium, uh, which would link the converter station to the landfall point. Uh, the third one on the right is the submarine cable, which is made of copper. Uh, and you'll notice just, a, I suppose, a, an increase in mechanical armoring and protection on the cable um, based on the mechanical stresses that it, that it needs to endure in its while it's being laid and, and dangling off the, the edge of a, a cable laying vessel before it hits the seabed floor. And also then the water pressure um, above the cable while it's in operation. And we also have a, a, a sample of the fiber optic cable that was laid alongside EWIC as well. Um, in terms of the production or manufacturing of the cable, the, the cable is produced in long continuous lengths um, at the manufacturing facilities and it's wound onto what's known as uh, turntables um, for, for the, the longer sections or, or cable drums for, for shorter sections. The, the submarine cable is going to consist of a, a stranded conductor and it's up to the market at the moment to, to indicate to us whether they're going to provide that via an aluminium or, or copper conductor. Um, as indicated on the previous slide, you'll have concentric layers of insulation and screening, and the steel wire armoring gives the mechanical protection. Um, I think there's one more, yeah, just to give a, an example of, of the, the um, cable being laid on a vessel ready, ready for installation there. So it's, it's significant lengths that are installed on the cable vessel. And in our application of 500 kilometers, it's going to take a couple of campaigns to, to transport the cable from the manufacturing facility and, and lay it on the seabed between Ireland and France. Okay, um, in terms of the marine surveys, again, I'll just give a, a very quick overview of, of some of the marine surveys that have led us to identifying the route that, that we're taking. And, it would have all started with a desktop route investigation to identify potential marine routes between south coast of, of Ireland and the northwest coast of France. Uh, we would have looked at factors including what would be the shortest reasonable route and, and potential in engineering and environmental constraints. So we did come up with six viable routes to begin with uh, and then we followed a detailed constraint uh, analysis uh, to arrive at what we felt was a viable route between the east coast of Cork and Brittany. Um, it's fair to say that it wasn't the shortest route, 
but it was considered the best performing as it avoided um, technical and environmental constraints when compared with the other routes. But it also avoided the UK territorial waters, which would have introduced additional complexity um, and time during the consenting phase. And, and um, uh, there's an appreci appreciation there of cost for the project as well, that uh, any additional time does tend to manifest itself in, in cost as well. So we did take undertake detailed marine surveys then on, on that best performing route. Um, and you can see here, over the course of a couple of years, we looked at geophysical surveys. Um, we looked at the geology of the seabed. Uh, we looked at uh, were there any shipwrecks, etc., uh, along the proposed route. We did a, a UXO survey, which is an unexploded ordnance survey. Um, and, and it's not something that would always jump to mind for, for people, but I, I guess on the Irish side, there's there's less uh, knowledge or awareness of this, but along the French coast, there, there would be a um, risk of, of unexploded ordinances uh, uh, left over from, from previous world wars, etc. Benthic surveys would also have been undertaken uh, to look at the, the variance of the habitats along the route and, and whether there are special areas of conservation, etc. Um, Geotechnical surveys, uh, we looked at taking samples of the seabed floor to see what the, the composition of it was. Is it gravel? Is it soil? Is it clay? Um, so we, we took a lot of those to determine what the, the thermal resistivity is going to be along the route. Uh, and then we, we have various complementary studies as well, uh, burial assessment studies, archaeological impacts, um, external protection studies as well in terms of how we're going to protect the cable. So significant volume of, of study work that has led us to identifying a route that is 497 kilometers in length. It does, as I say, avoid the, the UK territorial waters and, and special protection areas or special areas of conservation. We do have a variable seabed geology. Um, it does vary along 500 kilometers of, of the route, which is, is only to be expected, but we don't have any major constraints. Uh, there's no anticipated uh, significant constraints that we can't overcome. We have 18 service cables that we are going to have to cross, um, and that's a, a big design consideration. And the max water depth along the entire route is going to be between 100 and 110 meters. Um, I think I have just this slide and then I'm going to pass over to Jan uh, and he's going to give an overview. So I, I'll give an overview of the Irish onshore cable and then Jan will do something similar for the, the French and, and give a, an overview of the, the installation methods, etc. So the route in Ireland is that the, the cable will come onshore at a beach known as Clay Castle uh, in Yol in East Cork. And it will, for a large part of the land portion, follow the N25. Uh, we will come off the N25 at the villages of, of Killa and Castle Martyr, and we will follow the road uh, to a town known as Churchtown, where we will go north and, and above the town of Middleton, and ultimately the cables will, will terminate at the converter station location at Bally Adam, and people from Ireland on, on the webinar this evening, particularly people from Cork, might know that as the old Amgen site in Carrick too. From there, then we're going to route approximately 10 kilometers of AC cable um, between the converter station site up to the existing Nokraha substation. Okay, I'll, I'll pass over to Jan. Yeah, it's fine. Um, for the French, uh, the onshore part of the project in France is located uh, in Brittany, in the west of France. Uh, the route runs from our substation uh, here that, um, uh, at La Martyre in France to the landfall at Cléder. It's uh, 40 kilometers away on the north of the, uh, along the coast. Um, we have two different crossings. One, it's a river and other, it's a railway. Uh, can you, next slide, uh, Karen, please? Thank you. Um, in France, the, uh, the cable are installed uh, in the civil work. Uh, it consists of two different ducts uh, for the power cable and uh, one or two different ducts for the fiber optic. Uh, these ducts are coated with, the the, with concrete. 
And uh, once the civil engineering is, is, uh, is done, we install the cable inside the, the depth uh, into a, inside a, a joint, uh, a joint uh, bay. And they are installed every 1.5 uh, kilometer or two kilometers also. Can you put the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, the complicated part of, uh, of, the, of the work is it is the, uh, um, the arrival of the cable drums for the, for the, at the, the, junk, um, the joint bay. Each, each drums weight uh, between uh, 50 and 70 tons, and uh, it is uh, really difficult to, 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 sorry, to deliver the, to deliver the, the cable uh, because uh, it is uh, really, uh, really important. Uh, after the installation, the cable manufacturer ma makes the joints, uh, which requ require uh, a lot of uh, know-how. It takes three weeks to install the for uh, for two joints. This is shown at uh, at the the yeah exactly. Can you put the next slide also? Ah, okay. And I tried to explain also the, the cable installation. The, the photo are provided for my previous project, uh, IFA2. Uh, it's a, a link between uh, France and UK. At uh, the first picture on the top left, uh, show the loading of the cable on the, on the board. Uh, 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 cable ship. The length depends of, on the cable, uh, on the weight of the cable. Uh, today, ships are capable, are capable of carrying um, a maximum of 70 to uh, 100 kilometers of cable. For the marine installation, the cable are installed as a bundle uh, with the fiber optic. The cable are laid on the seabed. The maximum depth for a selfie in connector is about 110 meters. Uh, then we proceed to a protection of all cables. Several solutions are possible and depend on the geotechnical condition. The first is called jetting, which injects water under pressure and allow the cable to be buried under its own weight. And for harder soil, we use trenching as shown in the picture below left. Finally, we check the perfect installation from the control room uh, that uh, it is on the, on, the, on, the, on the right. Uh, globally, just after, uh, we joined the cable between us. Uh, for selting in interconnector, we expect to have six different sections of cable. Uh, the joint of the cable need uh, some uh, meteo uh, window uh, clear with no wave and no wind. And um, the, for the two joints, we take uh, two weeks, uh, across two weeks to, of work. Uh, no, this is not a perfect world on the marine aspect. We sometimes have uh, to make several passes to, to reach the desired, the desired depth uh, from the, uh, the studies uh, described by Kieran before. Okay, it's, I let you, Kieran, finish, I think. Yeah. That's, that's great, Jan, thank you. Um, just to uh, allow my video to kick back in then. So yeah, just, just uh, coming towards the end then, just a, a quick status of the project. Um, we've, we've gone through a, a lot of milestones, I suppose, to date, and, and we have achieved a number of key statutory approvals from, from our national regulators, both, both in Ireland and France. Jan and I have spent uh, a lot of time over the course of the last two, two and a half years um, developing the, the technical specifications for the converter stations and, and for the cables and, and also assisting and supporting in the development of the EPC contracts. Culmination of, of all that is the, the launch of the invitation to negotiate or the, the invitation to tender, which is is happening this week, uh, which is a, a huge milestone for, for the project. And it really marks the, the next phase of the project in terms of securing uh, a tenderer and a contractor to deliver the works. Um, in parallel with all those activities, the, 
the consenting of the, the planning applications has been developed and, and uh, is imminent here on the Irish side. Um, and, and ultimately, we're gearing ourselves towards uh, what's known as the final investment decision, which is planned for, for 2022, where we hope to, to have suitable contractors uh, uh, awarded for, for all aspects of the project. Um, just to finish out then, um, I know some people may be aware of, of the clip that I'm about to show, but I, I couldn't let the opportunity pass again. Um, I think, look, it's, it's fair to say the project has, has garnered some attention throughout the course of its development, and, and it's received significant backing, um, both at national levels in Ireland and France, but, but also at EU level. And uh, a, a previous um, French ambassador to Ireland was a, a very key supporter of the project and did a lot of uh, good work in, in advancing the project and, and doing a, a lot of work to enhance the relationship between Ireland and France. On it. And, and one of the interviews that, or one of the presentations that he did was, was actually picked up by um, a TV show here in Ireland known as Savage Eye. Um, and they, they released this clip, which I'm, I'm hoping uh, works. And, uh, and hopefully Jan and I have, have done our work correctly to ensure that the scenario that I'm about to show you doesn't actually happen. And uh, my final uh, example will be on the very important energy project that will connect our two countries with an electric cable, 500 kil kilometers underwater, which will link uh, Cork, uh, Ireland and, and Brittany from Cork to, to Brest by 2026. It's a major undertaking. Hun uh, it's a 1 billion euro project. It will provide electricity to 450,000 homes in Ireland. It will boost the development of renewable energy in Ireland. It's the Celtic interconnector, which will be Ireland's physical link to the continent. I'd like to present this plug to the head of the electricity department. Great. Uh, well, look, that, that's that's it um, from myself and from Jan. I think at this point, Chris, I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, Kern and Jan, for an excellent presentation. I now have some questions for you. First question, how many joints will there be in the submarine cable? Yeah, I, th I think uh, for the moment uh, we consider four, uh, five, five joints on the, on the marine, uh, marine cable. Next question. Why have AC and DC cables? Why not all DC? I think um, we need to make the connection from, from the converter station in, into uh, the existing network here in Ireland. And that's the main driver for having the AC component as well. Um, on the Irish side, we were locating the converter station uh, a, a distance away from, from its connection point. Um, if we were to have DC to run all the way up, we would still need to have that interface of, of an AC connection from the converter station into the existing substation. So there'll always be that need for, for the AC component to make the final connection to the existing system. Okay, that's fine. A question from Sinisa Sustanovic. Why is a DC voltage of 320 kV being used as against more recent voltages of up to 525 kV. Use of the higher voltage will result in transmission of more power. Shall I take that one, Jan? Yeah, I think. 
So the we, we did we did quite a lot of analysis on on the the voltage level and and yes we're aware of of the advancements at the the higher voltage levels. Well, one of the key parameters for us is that we we ultimately have a technology that is tried, trusted, and implemented. And and voltage levels uh, of three twenty kV is is a, a much proven technology for XLP uh, at power transfer capacity levels of, of seven hundred. You know, if, if we were to have a, a higher uh, capacity interconnector, there would be benefits of having the higher voltage. However, for us uh, at the levels that we're, we're talking about here, 320 kV is, is more than sufficient. And it's a very well proven and, and trusted technology and, and voltage level for XLPE cables. Yeah. And also for the determination of that, uh, we consider uh, all the aspect for the, um, the economic aspect also and the losses for the, for the, um, for the transmission. Next question. You mentioned that the voltage is 400 kV AC for the interconnector in Ireland between Ocraha and the converter station. On the airgrid transmission circuit map of Ireland, there is no 400 kV network connected to Ocraha. Will you be stepping down to 220 kV in the converter station? Yes, yeah, yeah simple, simple answer, yes. We, we'll have a 400 kV cable um, that will be stepped down using a, a 400 to 220 kV transformer for the connection into Ocraha. A question now from Michael McCarthy. Is the data throughput capacity of the optic fibre cable known? And is it to facilitate an additional communications role between Ireland and Europe, or is it just for substation to substation communications? Or, yeah, again, Jan, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one and, and you can support me. So the, the transfer capacity of the fibre um, is, is to be determined. As I mentioned, we're, we're launching the tender for the project at the moment, and, and while we have set minimum performance requirements. We're also seeking improvements from the market on those performance requirements. So the, the I suppose the short answer there is it's not fully defined um, in terms of the, the data transfer capacity, but we will be seeking to, to ensure it fulfills its primary purpose, which is for the control and operation of the interconnector. Next question. Will the Celtic interconnector be limited by the SNSP limit. Uh, the, so the, the SNSP is the system non-synchronous penetration here in Ireland. Um, it, it, won't, it won't limit or, or have an impact other than it will facilitate the increased SNSP here in Ireland. So having the interconnector will, will permit us to, to operate the system with higher levels of, of SNSP um, I think here in Ireland, we've, we've recently completed the trial to have 70% SNSP uh, with a target then to, to keep increasing that in line with the 2030, 2030 targets, which I think is, is going to need up to 90 or 95% uh, renewables on the system at any one time. Another question. The mile interconnector had major cable problems with a relatively short marine cable run. What additional lessons were learned from these problems to allow a much longer marine cable run to France? Yeah, it's, uh, that is a good question. Um, I, I think first off, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with the problems that, that were encountered on, on Moyle, other than to say the Moyle interconnector is, I believe, an LCC technology um, and, and therefore uh, may use different cable types than, than what we're proposing here on Celtic. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the XLP cable that we're, we're looking to utilize here is, is at a voltage level uh, that is tried and trusted, um, and it has been implemented on a number of other interconnector projects around Europe recently. So from that regard, we would have confidence in the supplier base to, to deliver a reliable solution for this project. Next question. Would it be possible to clarify which of the two partners will be responsible for the EPC of the subsea section of the cable? Yeah, uh, well, simple answer is, is we both are. It's, it's a joint venture uh, to procure um, the, the infrastructure here. Uh, we, we've set up a, a joint venture known as CDAC. Uh, so it's a single entity that's procuring the equipment on behalf of Airgrid and RTE. Next question from Ben Pape. 
Will submarine cables be buried to improve reliability? Uh, Jan, yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll give the answer. The submarine cables are, are there to, to protect the cables um, uh, and to prevent damage. So ultimately, uh, it is to ensure reliability of, of the cable system. Where they aren't buried or, or the seabed conditions don't permit them to be buried, we do protect them with, with concrete mattressing or, or rock protection. So the, the cable will be covered for the entire route to, to ensure it, it isn't damaged. Um, by anchor drag or, or any other marine activities. It is also the, the case uh, when we cross uh, different, uh, different uh, network, we protect uh, with the uh, rock dumping. Thank you, and next question. Have the commercial arrangements been set up to allow the new interconnector to bid into the ISEM and also the French market? What are the predicted price influences this interconnector will have on the ISEM. Okay, so yeah, I think the second part of that question um, was was maybe covered um, by by the objectives and benefits in terms of connecting the SEM here in Ireland to the to the European market. The 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 first part of that uh, question is that that is the next phase in, in which we're looking at here. Um, you know, the project development phases to this date have been around feasibility and procurement and EPC preparedness. We're now transitioning, I guess, into an operational mindset and, and you know, uh, market tools and market integration. So that will be the next step of the, the project teams over the course of the coming years. Um, we have to remember that the, the energization date of this is 2026. Uh, so we're, we're five, five and a bit years off, off that at the moment. A question from Andrew Larkins. Is there a detailed specification for the converter publicly available? I am interested to see how you are specifying a voltage source black start capable system. It's, uh, I, I, I suppose in one regard it is publicly available, but to the, to the pre-qualified tenders that have been through the, the procurement process, um, that, that we have initiated. Uh, so that the specifications have, have gone out to the market to the pre-qualified suppliers. A question from Tom Luby. What is the required burial depth of the cable on the seabed? Oh. I think I might leave this one to you, Jan. <laughs> you know, clearly it depends on the soil. If, the, we, if we have a soft soil, we are, we are um, deeper than, uh, than it is uh, hard. And uh, it depends also of the of the using of the of the marine aspect. If we have uh, some honkers or, or uh, 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 the, the 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 start of the channel, we have a lot of uh, of uh, marine uh, marine uh, usage, and uh, we we can uh, go deeper. But uh, globally, uh, in general, it's around uh, one one point five meters to uh, zero point six, something like this. Final question: On the RTE side. What are the ducts made of, steel or polypropylene? Why ducts and concrete rather than directly buried? Okay, uh, on the RT side, we used only uh, pop, um, polypropylene, uh, HDPE, uh, with a specific, uh, specific uh, condition uh, for the high temperature. And uh, we, we don't use, uh, we don't uh, put directly the, the cable uh, on the on soil because uh, for the first is the protection of the of the cable with uh, some uh, some works uh, around and the second um, we have a law that we expect from RT to to contain a, a fault if if we have any any fault uh, on the cable system. Thanks to Karen and Jan for answering all of the questions in such a comprehensive manner. I now wish to invite Tim Lorcan, Chair of the France Network, to propose the vote of thanks. Tim. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very interesting presentation tonight. We're obviously a pre, um, near nearing accomplishment of uh, the project. Hopefully the plug problem won't be a real problem as um, we have two such eminent engineers such as you dealing with that one. Um, again, thank you on behalf of the people here in France and in air. It's um, a subject which 
is clearly of interest to everybody. Uh, we have 170 people tonight, 400 were interested. And maybe we can invite you back um, when you finish the project to tell us the final details and show us some of the uh, information about how it's being used and how the renewable energy and nuclear energy going the other way potentially um, is received and working well. So thank you very much and maybe to the next time. Merci beaucoup, uh, Yann. De rien, avec plaisir. Thanks, Tim. And thanks again to Kieran and Jan for such an excellent presentation. Thanks for all who attended this evening and looking forward to seeing you all at our next presentation. Good night. <laughs>